Texas Child Support Guidelines is a statutory calculation based on the obligor's monthly net resources. The guidelines as applied will give you a calculation of what the legislature has told judges that an obligor should pay. For the most part, you can do one of four things when you go to court as it applies to guidelines. You can do guideline support, below guideline support, above guideline support, or no child support. Now, generally when you do no child support, uh, in the past that has been frowned upon by the courts based on a Supreme Court case uh, in Ray Stephanie Lee from uh, about 10 years ago and in the 1st and 14th Court of Appeals in the greater Houston area, uh, in the Minix case, we have uh, the ability to put agreements into what's called a mediated settlement agreement. If you use this form and you do not have an objection from the Attorney General of Texas, uh, the courts will uh, approve no child support orders. Now, in Harris County, you will find a majority, close to majority of the current judges will approve no child support orders. But then if the attorney general objects, then yes, you will have uh, some issues there and probably will have to adjust. What is child support? A parent has a natural moral obligation to provide for the support of his or her offspring. A court's child support order can require either or both parents to support a child. There are multiple options for the payment of child support. Child support payments can be ordered through periodic payments, lump sum payments, an annuity purchase, the setting aside of property, or any combination of the above. Child support is a general phrase that can describe five different categories of support. Current child support. There is a child support ordered by the court for the support of a child after the entry of an order. Temporary child support. This is child support ordered by a court in a penny matter for the safety and welfare of the child. Retroactive child support. These funds are identified by the court as repayment for money spent for the care and support of the child in the past. Courts can order retroactive child support if the parents have not been previously ordered to pay support and were not a party to a suit for which support was ordered. Medical child support. This is child support for the payments of medical expenses that can be ordered in any proceeding in which periodic payments of child support are ordered. Any other suit affecting the parent-child relationship in which the court determines that medical support of the child must be established, modified, or clarified. Dental child support. This is child support for the payments of dental costs that can be ordered in a suit affecting the parent-child relationship. How do you determine your net resources for uh, child support? The definition is given to us by the Texas Family Code, looks at your monthly resources. And that definition is 100% of all wages and salaries, income and other compensation for personal services, includes commissions, overtime pay, tips and bonuses, interest, dividends and royalty income, self-employment income, net rental income defined as rent after deducting operating expenses and mortgage payments, but not including non-cash items such as depreciation and all other, all other income actually being received, including severance pay, retirement benefits, pensions, trust income, annuity, capital gains, social security benefits, other than supplemental security income, United States Department of Veterans Affairs disability benefits other than non-service connected disability pension benefits, unemployment benefits, disability and workers compensation benefits, interest income from notes regardless of the source, gifts and prizes, spousal maintenance, and alimony. Types of income. So the issue becomes many times when someone is self-employed, 
they get cash or they expense a lot of the uh, expenses for their business. So it's hard many times to determine what the child support obligation should be. And so what you do is you have to look at uh, bank statements generally. And then if you have a um, ability to look at the businesses accounts, their work that they're doing, their form of payment, then sometimes you can reconstruct it that way. Documented income. This is evidence of income that stipulates a finite amount. Tax returns, bank statements, W-2s, 1099s. Deemed income. This is income which is not earned but received by certain past allowances of deductions and received subsequently. The courts have determined that assets that are not currently producing income may be considered deemed income for the purposes of identifying monthly resources. It is prudent for the attorney to include all areas in which an obligor may receive income as permitted by the statute. Self-employment income. The income attributed to self-employment is quite expansive, which includes compensation from proprietorships, joint ventures, partnerships, closed corporations, agencies, DBA, and independent contracts, less than any necessary expenses. Varying income. If the party's income varies from month to month, the courts have applied a range of income or average to identify monthly resources. The Court of Appeals, in one particular case, found it abused its discretion in determining monthly income resources by averaging the obligor's income over time. Then you have hidden income. Hidden income uh, usually is going to be cash, Bitcoin. Expenses to be deducted in determining monthly net resources. So you get certain expenses to determine your monthly net resources. And for the W-2 obligor, that is the easiest calculation to make. So once you determine the monthly resources of the obligor, then that obligor is entitled to certain deductions. These deductions include social security taxes, federal income taxes based on the tax rate for a single person claiming one personal exemption and standard deduction, state income tax, union dues, expenses for the health insurance or cash medical support of the obligor's child ordered by the court, and if the obligor does not pay Social Security taxes, non-discretionary retirement plan contributions. This is usually railroad workers. Sometimes it can be uh, teachers. Calculation of guideline child support. So what you have is you have a, an attorney general chart. And that chart will give you uh, a percentage based on how many children are before the court. The easiest calculation is to take the maximum amount and you do have a maximum amount for guideline child support which is at the time of this video ninety two hundred dollars per month as your net this amount if you have one child before the court and you were to times it by 20 then that comes up to your maximum guideline child support for which you would be subject to so if you are making approximately one hundred fifty thousand a year as your uh, salary through whatever company you work for and then you end up netting 9200 a month uh, your maximum would be 1840 so 9200 times 20 is 1840 per month if you have a second child before the court then you go up five for five percentage points to 25 percent third child is 30 percent and so on until you get to 50% and the courts do not uh, allow more than 50% of your wages to be withheld. So while you still may have an obligation to pay, they will not withhold more than 50% of your wages. And many times someone who is on Social Security or uh, have some, tor some form of veterans benefits is also receiving a child support payment for the child 
about 15 years ago, it used to be you did not get credit for your child receiving benefits under your Social Security. Uh, that changed, and as it changed, then you, as a child support obligor who is on Social Security and is paying child support, you really need to go and file for your uh, child's social security that your child can draw from you because you'll get a credit towards your child support obligation. Same thing with veterans benefits, rebutting the guidelines or above and below guidelines. Above guidelines child support for someone who makes over $9,200 a month. So what you have is you have, as I initially discussed at the beginning, you have guideline child support, below guideline child support, above guideline child support, and no child support. Usually no child support is considered offensive and you will have a hard time getting that approved in most places in Texas. As a practitioner in Harris County, I can tell you that about half of the courts will approve it because they don't want to create an obstacle where you have to go to mediation. Once you go to mediation, they have to approve it subject to an attorney general objection and the attorney generals do not generally uh, now object as they once did. They usually allow those to be approved. This comes up with someone who's drawing some form of state aid. So if you're getting Medicaid or food stamps, then the attorney general has a state interest to obligate one of the parties to pay child support. Uh, in the past, they pushed that more uh, in the last couple of years. They've, uh, they still push the cash medical for the Medicaid. Someone usually has to pay cash medical and that's usually around $100 a month. Otherwise, they're not as likely to push the child support obligation. So by agreement, you can agree to a couple two, three hundred dollars $300 a month and uh, that generally will be approved by most courts. So you have a presumption of minimum wage, a uh, obligor is presumed to be able to make at least the federal minimum wage, which comes up to about $230 a month. It fluctuates every year a little bit based on the guideline charts as promulgated by the attorney general. So how do you get above or below guideline child support? We have to plead for it. And there's certain factors you look at. The needs of the child is a topic of much discussion when the obligor's net monthly resources exceed the cap of 9,200 monthly. When an obligor's resources exceeds the cap, it grants the court discretion to order additional amounts of support above the presumptive amount. Several steps are necessary for the court to compute this task. The court must first determine the proven needs of the child. Once the proven needs of the child have been ascertained, the court must then subtract the guideline presumptive amount from the proven needs of the child and finally allocate between both parents the remaining amount. In no event may the court require an obligor to pay more than 100% of the proven needs of the child. However, if the obligor's monthly net resources are below the cap, the court is not required to ascertain the proven needs of the child. The needs of the child is one factor for the court to consider in determining child support, but is not probative or conclusory. An obligor with monthly net resources below the 9,200 can be required to pay an amount of child support that exceeds the proven needs of the child. However, an obligor with the monthly net resources above 9,200 cannot. So many times you'll have uh, a family with uh, high income and you'll have a child in private school with tutors and that could cause the child support uh, amount to be not enough to cover those academic payments along with the tutoring or the music lessons that uh, may go on. So those would be proven needs of the child. And so as those are proven needs of the child, then if you have that documented, you can usually ask for more. With the obligor being under $9,200, let me tell you, it's hard to get judges to pay, uh, order one to pay above guideline child support. Usually if you have a disability or you have uh, 
a lack of visitation of one parent, then you can get more. So the obligee parent, the primary parent who takes care of the child during the week and the obligor parent does not spend any time with the child, then that is my easiest route to get above guideline child support. But for the most part, the courts are pretty uh, strict with the child support guidelines. They stay within them. Uh, but I have tried both above guideline child support and below guideline child support. And then a obligor who makes above the cap and below the cap. And as I've tried those cases on many times, I can tell you based on my experience, uh, you need good uh, documented proof if you're above the cap and if you're below the cap then you your best case is a lack of possession access when you look at the standard possession order it is 42 percent of the time with the non-primary parent and so if the non-primary parent is exercising that those periods of possession then they're feeding the child they're clothing the child they're entertaining the child during that time if you expand it out to the expanded possession order which is thursdays when school lets out and then uh, during the school year and then uh, on weekends friday when school lets out to so school resumes on monday on the first third and fifth weekends that's almost 47 percent of the time that the child is with the non-primary so that parent who exercises the expanded possession order is necessarily going to be spending quite a, quite a lot of money on the child by feeding the child, entertaining the child. So the courts, as they apply the guidelines, usually will not order much above guidelines. Uh, my name is Michael Busby. I'm a Houston family law and divorce attorney. If you like my video, please like and subscribe. Thank you.